Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for taking the time to attend our presentation today. And I hope over the next 20 minutes or so, we can share with you some of the inspirational activity uh, that we've had going on at the University of Central Lancashire over the past three years with regards to our transformational change in education. So the University of Central Lancashire, for those of you that don't know, we're based in the city of Preston in northwest England in Lancashire. And we've got a student population of around 28,000 students. We hover around the top 20 universities in the UK in terms of student number. And we've got a staff complement of approximately 4,250. And 2,500 of those staff members are academic staff members. And our transformational change has been geared predominantly towards the academic community. Three years ago, we developed a new and launched a new learning and teaching strategy. Myself and Chris are both based in the technology-enabled learning and teaching team at the university. So learning and teaching is very much at the heart of what we do. And we look at ways in which technology can be used effectively and embedded in the curriculum to enhance our students' learning experience. So the launch of the strategy was, was of great interest to us. And it was very ambitious in terms of the objectives within it. But like most strategies that we've got at the university, the implementation level of the strategy is left to the support services and the schools to develop and look at how we can make best, uh, best use or, or best approaches to achieving the objectives within, within the strategy. So the strategy was launched and we did quite a bit of work with our faculty teams and our school teams to really try and understand what the university was trying to achieve with, with the, the, the learning and teaching strategy. So we saw research externally, and one particular survey that we, we really did uh, take a great deal of note about was the, the Digital Experience Insights Survey from JISC. And in 2017, the content that was published with regards to the polling of HE staff members, for me, certainly had some striking issues in there with regards to the sentiment amongst academic staff with regards to their digital capabilities and the time that they're given to develop those digital capabilities and we've run many many sessions at the university since we, we hold sessions on a regular basis and the one thing that comes up regularly at those sessions is that staff do not feel they are given sufficient time to develop the things that we're saying we believe have value in learning and teaching so to say that one in ten staff feel the same outside of, of our organization and this was reflected directly from the focus groups we ran inside the organization for me this is a real issue we've got a real problem with regards to time that we allocate academic staff to their personal development and the other one that that you know for me it's, it's a bit of a sorry thing really that people don't feel that there's reward or recognition so academic staff are taking time to look at technology to evaluate technology to enhance their practice for what ultimately to enhance the student learning experience, but where's the reward and recognition for them in terms of their professional development? So the two things there for me, 10% uh, of, of academic staff that are responding in this way, there's really something that needs to change. So we, we sat with our academic leads and we looked at the learning and teaching strategy. And for us as a technology enabled learning and teaching team, digital is really at the heart of all we do. And that was our light bulb moment because we felt that the objectives within the strategy all could benefit from some degree of digital being embedded in the approach. So we looked at the whole thing and we thought it's, it's a huge strategy in terms of the overall size. How can we break it down into manageable components that we as a team feel that we can be effective at supporting? So in year one, we looked at the people. I, I will absolutely wholeheartedly say that in any transformational project, people are the absolute core of the success. Without the people on board, without the people being understood and being listened to and feeling empowered with the change that you're trying to drive forward, it's an impossible task. So for us, investment in the people was a priority. That was number one in year one. In year two, we looked at the place, the environment in which we teach, we learn, and we work. In a university, that's the office spaces that we have that we occupy, the teaching rooms, the general spaces, the specialist spaces, the lecture theatres, and the social spaces. How can we gear those environments to support the digital, uh, digital method of working? And finally, practice, professional practice, whether that's professional academic practice or practice within our professional services. That was year three. 
So the people investment. For us, we have had a desktop PC experience 30, 35 years that served the university magnificently well. But about five, six years ago, six years ago, 2014, um, we were asked to investigate whether or not the desktop computer really was going to be the way forward for the next 25, 30 years, or did we need to look at technology that could embrace some of the newer methods of working? And at the same time, we had the problem where we're investing in the desktop PC for every member of staff, but more and more people wanting to work flexibly or away from the office, certainly traveling overseas. We have campuses overseas in, in different countries. They couldn't take that desktop PC with them, so they needed a portable device as well. So we had a, a huge number of staff who had a desktop PC and a laptop, and then at times were wanting some form of tablet device because the laptop was too heavy. And before we knew it, we had an unsustainable model of investing three to three and a half thousand pounds in client technology for academic staff to do their job effectively. So we did an evaluation program in 2014, and we looked at a whole range of devices uh, that would offer portability, flexibility, and have within them, built within them, the capability to utilize applications that we felt were going to be part of our digital transformation. So Surface, for us, in September 2014, with the launch of the Surface Pro 3, we felt that was the device that could genuinely replace the desktop PC in terms of its capability. But when we say Surface, it's not just the Surface device itself, it's the docking station, the full-size monitor, the mouse and keyboard. So in a portable mode, you've got the device you can take away, but for extended periods of work or study, you have the docking station and you've got the desktop experience. But the power and capability of the Surface at the time could certainly replace the desktop PC that we had uh, available for most staff within the university. So we've currently got a deployment of around nearly 3,000 Surface devices across the organization, and all academic staff, unless they have requested otherwise, are provisioned with a Surface device, the docking station, the monitor, mouse and keyboard. That's now our standard provision for academic staff across the organization because they can utilize that technology to fully embrace the applications that we promote. We've also got uh, 270 general teaching spaces or meeting rooms that are equipped with docking station. The one thing I will say about a portable device that most academic staff fed back is if you forget your charger and the device goes flat, what are you meant to do? So all our teaching spaces are provisioned with docking capability for power and projection if they need it, and also with wireless projection capability so they can work around the classroom with students rather than standing at the front and presenting in this way. We decided in our lecture theatres that we would implement a Surface Studio solution because the power of the stu studio meant that any application that anybody wanted to run, they had the capability within that device to do so. So all our 10 main lecture theatres are equipped with Surface Studio. And we've also got a number of Surface Book users, the power users, predominantly in engineering and architecture, where they use power apps. We've, we've deployed a Surface Book. The downside with regards to the book compared to the Pro, obviously, is the cost increase. So at the moment, we're just piloting a solution, an Azure solution, um, to deliver apps online, a VDI solution for delivering power apps from the Surface Pro or Surface Laptop. So we, we probably won't do as much investment in the Surface book. We're moving more towards the Azure platform for that solution. And we're just about to launch an initiative called Surface Go Study. Um, at the moment, we, we, as a university, we have a significant widening participation agenda. So a lot of our students aren't necessarily equipped with devices themselves, and we make provision for that within the university, within the university library. So we're having 70 Surface Goes installed that a student can loan, can take away around the library if they wish to work in a portable way, but Surface Go Connect stations based throughout the library where they can dock the device for those extended periods of study. So with regards to practice, the third element of our transformation, our faculty learning technologists, of which Chris is one, we have a number of those in the organization, and we align those to work directly with the faculties to develop personal working relationships with the staff within them. They were given three objectives. They were asked to foster a, a sharing uh, community, uh, to share informed practice. We know that there's, there's practice going on across the organization, but we need to pick it up in one school and share it with another. We've got some great stuff going on. We've got to make better ways of sharing that practice. 
We want to raise the digital capabilities, going back to the JISC Insight survey. We know that one in 10 staff feel that they're adequately equipped, nine out of 10 don't. So the objective of the learning technologists was to raise the digital capabilities across the faculty and to develop an online community. We can't always engage in face-to-face, -face, but we can certainly make provision for an online community that can develop and work for everybody, utilizing the flexibility of surface, surface devices. Yes. Okay. <coughs> Thanks, Kev. So in being tasked with these three faculty level objectives, the key thing for me, and it's something that Kev's already mentioned, is it wasn't going to start with technology, and it actually wasn't going to start with pedagogy. It was going to start with people, because our staff are absolutely at the heart of this initiative. And that was about enabling conversations and really encouraging a culture of sharing practice and collaboration across the academic community, which is really illustrated in this model here on the left. And there's three ways that we did that. The first way was to actually set up a World Cafe event where staff just engaged in discussion around what they were already doing, what worked, what didn't work, and how we could better support them to meet their development needs, which is really, really important. The second activity was to actually just encourage staff to get out there and present their fantastic practice at different events, both at faculty level and institutional level. And the third was actually a case of collating a series of really in-depth case studies so colleagues could share their practice again further. And that could be a bit of a go-to guide in terms of excellence in the use of technology to enhance learning, teaching, and assessment. So those were three key actions, really, to get the ball rolling with this. Um, and the second aspect I'd just like to pick up on this model is this idea that as a colleague moves through this four-step model and ultimately our de development framework, which I'll look at in a minute, the idea is their sphere of influence will expand from them as an individual to faculty level to institutional level and in many cases sector level influence and impact. So as Kev has mentioned, you know, as a large organization, digital capabilities are a large challenge for us, and both for staff and students. But ultimately, if we want to be authentic in our approach in developing work-ready graduates, this has to start with our staff in equipping them, developing their capability to help them innovate in their practice, and ultimately embed digital within their curriculum. And another thing that Kev mentioned, so time is a huge, huge factor for our staff not just where can I fit the CPD activities around my academic workload, but also where do I start and how do I know what's going to be of most benefit to me? And I have to say that is absolutely where the Microsoft Educator Center and community came into play because what it did is it provided an opportunity for staff to engage in these small chunks of CPD that they could fit around their busy academic workload. And not just that, but these, these CPD chunks were actually stitched into larger learning pathways so they could see where their learning was going. And as well as that, there was the gamification and the fun side of it. But, uh, sorry, staff were actually earning points and badges and wearing lanyards. And it, there was a lot of fun around the initiative, which was something that we'd not really explored with our development offer for staff previously. So I would absolutely recommend, if you're not part of the Microsoft Education community, have a look. Get signed up today, because it's a fantastic resource and a great community to be part of. So the third objective, which really pulled on the first two, was to bring some of those conversations into an online community something that was accessible and that staff could access on a daily basis as a, a support resource, really. And this is where Microsoft Teams came into play because we could facilitate this space where we had different channels according to different as aspects of their practice, whether that be assessment and feedback, communication and collaboration, resources and content, etc. And what this actually became was a huge knowledge bank of expertise and support and something, again, that we'd never had before and extended our role and reach as a tell team in the university. And the culmination of those three objectives and the various outputs led to the development of DigiLearn, which is our digital development framework and program for academic staff, within which we have three levels, practitioner, advocate, and champion. And the core thing for us is we didn't want this to be tokenistic. We didn't want to go for a bronze, silver, gold, or a level one, two, three. This was about empowering an academic community. We wanted to use empowering words and active words because these weren't just titles. They were roles and responsibilities within the faculty. And this is actually the framework, which I appreciate. There's a lot of stuff on here. It's probably a presentation within itself. This is the framework with the three levels and the various criteria that staff self-submit against uh, in, in the various areas, if you will. And a couple of key things I'll point out is that all staff start at practitioner. So that's a baseline level. And that can be facilitated within a two-hour workshop, which is led by either myself, a member of the TELT team, uh, in collaboration with a, an academic colleague who's already a champion or advocate. They can do it in their own time and pick it up uh, with their Surface Pro flexibly from wherever they are. Or they can go down a mentorship route, which is something I'm going to talk a little bit more about in a, a couple of minutes. 
Um, you'll see there's a number of parallel strands as well. So the entry point to this program for all staff is to engage in DigiPath, which is our self-assessment tool for staff. So it's really about them finding out where their strengths and weaknesses lie in relation to digital creation, digital innovation, digital identity, and all the different aspects of that tool. Um, we've got other parallel elements, so contribution to that faculty, faculty community, which is really the hub of this initiative. Again, going back to the idea that it really is about people first. We've embedded surface technology in there because we really want to find out about how people are using their surface to innovate in their practice. And we've heavily embedded the Microsoft Educator community because it is such a fantastic resource for our staff to engage in, both for the technology packages and the pedagogy focus packages, of which there are so many and of great value. Now, the remaining criteria around, or around, sorry, uh, sharing practice, uh, which is ultimately what this is all about, whether that be through blog posts, case studies, presentations, and the main distinction between advocate and champion level is actually a shift from internal impact and influence to external impact. And if we think back to that sphere of influence, that's really where champion comes into play, where colleagues are getting out in the sector, of which we've had multiple colleagues presenting at Microsoft events, BET, JISC events, and, and all over the place, which is really, really encouraging to see. Okay. Now, I mentioned mentorship, and this is a big element of our program. And one way that we facilitated this mentorship was actually to harness Flipgrid, which is a really fantastic tool where you can create short video clips and spark discussion. And we use this to facilitate mentorship dialogue. So the idea is as colleagues get to advocate and champion, they post a video on here and share a bit about their journey. What is it that makes them passionate about their role and what technology they're using and how they can help other people. So it's really them sticking their hand out and saying, you know, I want to help you. Let's, let's start that dialogue and let, let's get this moving. And it's really encouraging to, to see these. And you can see the happy faces on here. People are more than happy to help and support other people, which is really encouraging to see. Now, as we started to get uh, advocates and champions in our program, quite rightly, colleagues started to say, well, what next? If I've completed the levels and I've got my badge and I've got my lanyard, what's next? And actually, that's where we started to look at role profiles to say, yes, you might be a digital and advocate or a champion in 2019, but if you want to carry that over to 2020, you need to evidence how you're engaged in these activities to maintain that status because we want to keep it current, we want to keep it fresh. And this also gives us the opportunity to review those criteria and take feedback from the academic community as well, which is really, really important to us, as I say, with staff being at the heart of the initiative. So I'm just going to go over a couple of uh, evaluation stats. What's really encouraging is to see the vast majority of staff agree that this experience has helped increase their skills and or knowledge in a number of areas, which is really good. And 75% have already been able to see that in practice, that it's actually made an impact, which is really encouraging because we asked that quite early on in the process. But I have to say, these are the ones that are the most important to me. The fact that staff are actually feeling much more supported in their role. They are f feeling part of this network of support, which, as I say, extends our role and reach as a technology-enabled learning and teaching team. And not only that, but they're actually feeling more able to support others as well, which, as I say, really, really positive and really rewarding for us to see as a team. So this is a quick quote from one of our digital and champions who actually presented with me on this stage last year, uh, Andrew Sprake, who's a lecturer in the School of Sport and Health Sciences at UCLan. And it's interesting how he reflects on his experiences as both being celebratory and that it helped him to realize, actually, I am, I am really innovating in my practice and there's some great work there, but also progressive in developing new skills and developing his digital pedagogy as well. And it's presented him with a lot of opportunities to get out there and, and more broadly share what he's doing and impact and influence on other colleagues and other institutions ultimately. So a quick rundown, what are the four steps to delivering a successful staff CD approach, CPD approach like this? Start with the community. It's about people, ultimately. We have to invest in people. That then leads into empowering your digital champions, so your early adopters, your innovators. Work with them, invest in them, because ultimately their passion is going to spread to their colleagues and they're going to influence and inspire other people. Make sure that your pathways are structured and flexible, so we need to help staff navigate through that huge sea of CPD that's out there, but also appreciate that as well as our students having different learning needs, so do our staff. So we need to think about provide workshops, provide webinars, provide one-to-one -one support. Whatever it is they need, bring it to them. And finally, gamify the process. Let's make it fun. Badges, points, all that kind of stuff. From our experience in HE, staff absolutely love it. So don't believe a word if you hear anything any different. Okay, and I'd just like to raise as well, you've heard about how we've used Microsoft Teams uh, as, for a faculty-based community, but there are some fantastic resources out there for you to look at how other institutions across the sector are using Teams uh, in various different circumstances, and some fantastic examples, I have to say, so do take a note of that link and check those out. 
yes. Okay, so the next steps for the university with regards to uh, this project. We need to roll DigiLearn out across all our faculties. We piloted the program in health and well-being, and we're in the process currently of rolling this out into other faculties. We are aware at this stage that the model as it currently stands can be adapted, it can be changed, and there's some really interesting conversations starting with colleagues in engineering and computing and art design and fashion on how we can adapt that program to make it more relevant to their particular teaching needs. We also need to evaluate the program. So we're entering the fourth year now of our digital transformation, our people, our places, our practice. This is the fourth year. So within the fourth year, we have to genuinely be able to provide some hard evidence about the impact of this project. So the areas that we're looking at as an organization of measuring are student progression. Are our students progressing from year one to two, two to three, and three to four, and, and graduating? Are our grade and attainment outcomes improving? and are our employability outcomes improving on programs where academic staff who've engaged with this project are, 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 uh, are teaching. So evaluation certainly is a big part of, of the fourth phase of this project. An annual review. We don't want to think that the, the, the program is in stone. It's got to continue to evolve. It will evolve as technology evolves. And we'd like to think that as a champion, one of the role requirements of a DigiLearn champion is that you will be part of the team of people who will continue to evolve this model for the next ac academic year within the university. Because they are the people that, that are really at the coal face of this action. And they are the ones that can feed in the best uh, amendments and recommendations for change. The question comes up regularly. Once we get staff onto advocate and certainly onto champion level, the question they've got is whilst they feel significantly more developed than they were before they engaged in the program, what about our students? Can we have a similar program and a similar framework for students? So we have just launched this year, and we will uh, evaluate this at the end of the year, a program called DigiReady which is all about developing digital capability in students so that we can have work-ready graduates. They are digitally ready for the modern workplace. That program has launched, and we'll evaluate that at the end of the academic year. If that's successful, we'll look at accreditation through the Institute of Leadership and Management, and that can then be rolled out across the organization to any students where the academics feel that they can support the students on that journey. And we also want to position UCLan as a catalyst and hub for tell knowledge and exchange. I, I always say at sessions that I run, it's great to see colleagues within the School of Nursing talking to academic colleagues in engineering about a particular digitally informed practice. And we're seeing that sharing of practice go on across schools within the organization. At events like this, it's a fantastic opportunity to meet with people from other organizations and share practice from with other, other HE, FE, uh, and school-based education organizations. I think the sharing of practice is the one thing that really is what's been successful, taking a practice-informed approach rather than a technology-first approach. So with regards to the, the, the sector, we've created um, an initiative called DigiLearn Sector that people can join. Yeah, you can, you can share practice in there and you can see the practice that's currently being shared by others. We've got a short video just to show about DigiLearn Sector that I'll play and then I've got one more slide to wrap up. The DigiLearn Sector is a vibrant community all about collaboration. We host a series of informative monthly webinars, as well as physical meetups like today's Connect event, all around educational technology and digital practice. I feel the benefits of being a part of the DigiLearn sector are the fact that it's founded by real teachers, real people, and you can collaborate and share best practice. I think the benefits are sharing, collaborating, um, the magpie effect, um, I talk about quite a bit, just that not reinventing the wheel, seeing what else is out there, regardless of the platform they're using, uh, and being agnostic, I think that's a really, really key feature. What's unique is that it's bringing sectors from further education, higher education, and even down to primary and secondary. For us, one of the benefits is being able to say to colleagues um, what they found the main challenges to be, how they would have done it better, so we can learn from other people's experience, which is really a benefit to a small institution like ours. The benefit of joining the community has been the number of people that I've met that I wouldn't have otherwise met who shared good practice and things that they're doing. So we can ask questions and have problems and people help us to solve them. It's just made everything so much easier. At UCLan, we really want to work with other universities, colleges, schools and organisations to share our experiences 
and really learn from each other. We all face the same challenges across the education sector. I think it's really important that we help prepare ourselves and our students in this ever-evolving digital landscape. So the QR code is on screen. If you want to join that DigiLearn community, you are all invited to do so. The QR code, the web link's there on screen if you want to join. We hold regular web webinars. This is the interesting thing about the actual community. So we've got people, right. academics, who are currently engaged in digital practice, sharing that practice Absolutely. with yeah. colleagues who are logged in online. So regular webinar webinars from academic staff and from industry experts who are sharing some of the insights into some new and emerging technologies. And we also have, at the moment, uh, around 500 members within uh, just over six months the community's been running. There's approximately 500 members on there from 204 organisations. So we really are getting to see some of the practice being shared across the education sphere. And to see people take practice from, from a school delivery, enhance that or change that or adapt it and deploy that in HE sector, that is where the value of that community lies. So it's all about practice. It's about taking a practice-informed approach. Now, as Chris said in the video, the, the, the environment in which we work, the digital landscape, it is continually changing. And our digital transformation, it's not over. It's not finished. It's not a project that's done. We haven't reached the end point. It's ongoing. So in a little over five months' time, uh, we'll be hosting an event at UCLan, which you know every, everyone's welcome to, to attend if you like, as we continue uh, to explore and investigate the impacts of Microsoft Surface and Office 365 on the digital transformation at UCLan. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll take the first one. Yep. Yeah. Um, vanity purchase. Yep. Yeah. It's very difficult to say there is a single device that will suit everybody. And we accept that there is no single device that will, will suit everybody. What I do like about the Surface device in particular is within the fleet of Surface devices, you have the whole range from the Surface Go all the way up to the Surface Studio. And I think as the fleet has, has continued to evolve and more models have continued to be uh, released, we have managed on most occasions uh, to bring people in to see where that particular device can benefit them. Um, I don't see them as vanity purchases. I think I what we were spending in terms of, of desktop PCs and laptops and tablets, and we, you add all that together, whilst the initial purchase price of the, the portable device was a little bit more than the desktop device, it's allowing us to do, to do so much more and be so much more productive. Um, so for people who don't want one, there's no, you have to have one. It is still a choice. You can have a desktop PC or a portable device. And in some areas of the university, we, we have to accept um, that a, a Windows-based device is not the one for them. They, they can't do that. Uh, they, they need something different. So we do still allow that. It's a conversation that we have with colleagues um, at the point of equipping them with their device. Yeah, okay. Do you want me to take that one? Perform, develop. Debbie Spencer? Yeah. Yeah, I'll just take that second question there no, from Jess Jones. I haven't really activated through presence. Which is All right. Uh, around how a teacher has used the skills they've learned in DigiLearn to implement something new into the teaching. And I think there are multiple examples of this. And, and one of the main types of example would be, the, would be our use of Microsoft Teams because we've heavily embedded that community within the initiative. Uh, staff have engaged with it so they can see how, how they respond to each other and how that can be a value into, in their practice. And ultimately, we've kind of transformed the landscape in terms of how students can collaborate and communicate with each other because our existing tools just didn't offer what that, that environment offers. So there's multiple examples of that, of which in joining the digital and sector, I'm sure our colleagues will be happy to, to share with you directly. 
I'll just take the, the next one. Um, yes, we did do lots of training. It was a completely different um, experience for staff from a desktop PC to a portable device. The biggest issue of which was ensuring the device was connected to the internet to give it the capability it needed. I will say, I actually forgot to mention in my presentation, that when, when we deployed a, a, a portable device prior, we had an experience that was on the desktop and when you, t when you had a corporate laptop, the experience was completely different. Not just because the device was portable, the operating system was different, its capability was different, what it could connect to was different. We completely changed that with Surface. The experience, whether you work on campus so or off, off campus, is oh, identical. Yeah, we opted for a technology called direct access uh, for networking connectivity. So it ensures the connection is identical. And all the user has to make sure they have is a web connection. And that parity of experience is what made the adoption far easier. Because there's nothing worse than deploying a new device and starting with a list of things you cannot do. Our experience was what you do on campus, you can then do from wherever you choose, so long as you have that internet connection. So yes, we did do lots of staff training. We had to, where we ran a lot of staff development sessions and we made lots of drop-in sessions available. But we've now got to a point where on the HR induction process, that's where academic staff, new academic staff, are provisioned with their device and they get that training at the point of their entry into UCLan. Do you want to set that one, Kev? The next one. Oh, next one. Digital journey. Uh, yeah, I think working with Microsoft, it's been, it's been mutually beneficial. I think there's a whole, what I do really like about the relationship with Microsoft is they're listening. So we're able to say we're working directly with academic staff and we're able to feed directly into, into the colleagues at Microsoft what adaptations, enhancements or changes are needed to make the technology that Microsoft are developing more effective and more relevant to the objectives that we have within education. So. Whether it will be better or worse, I like the ecosystem that Microsoft have. We've got Office 365, we've got the Surface technology, we've got the full network infrastructure, and it's all aligned to the same company. So I think for us, it's been beneficial, significantly beneficial to have that relationship. Uh, and I don't know who else we could have worked with to have gained such a, an in-depth relationship across the full ecosystem. I think that's where the benefit of having a, a, you know, a comfortable working relationship with Microsoft comes. It's across the whole suite, from the device and the hardware, the networking and the infrastructure, and the applications and the implementation. Uh, I think that's where the, the benefit really has, has, has been for us. Uh, we do, we do teach as well, so we, we kind of have a, a real mixed bag of people. Um, digital culture, the cultural change, I mean, that's what it is. It's a cultural change within academics, it's a cultural change within, within um, service staff. But we're quite lucky in the service that I'm based in, the learning and information services, that we have a quite a broad spectrum of, of, of responsibilities, whether that be working with technology, evaluating technology, or working with academic staff who use technology. Um, but each and every one of us at some point in our careers have done uh, teaching as well. So we kind of do see things from the academic point of view. But the the, the, the single benefit, I think, from my point of view, as a manager of a team of people, aligning colleagues, faculty learning technologists, to a particular faculty to develop personal working relationships, that has been the value and, and really aided the success of the project. And I think, again, it's, it's people. People are number one. You know, people, places, practice, people are number one. You've got to develop working relationships with people that work for everybody. Uh, and I think you've got to see things, from, from, you know, see things from everyone's point of view. But taking that practice-informed approach Approach allows us to genuinely put the academic in the driving seat, and I think that's what they see in terms of the empowerment that they have, uh, yeah. you know, with regards to the project. Yeah, I think I'd add to that one as well, just to say that a lot of work was put in initially around the people aspect and just bringing people together and starting that conversation. But what you'd start to see is this is uh, self-facilitating, really. Our staff start to take ownership of the initiative, and it's just part Some of their role to, to be a mentor and start supporting so colleagues and kind of collaborating with others as well. So there's a lot of work that went into it initially, yeah, that, but we can kind of take our foot off the gas a little bit, and it, it's definitely owned by the academic community, this, this stuff now. So. Okay, we've got one more question. I'll, I'll just take the, uh, the next, next one in the list in terms of the wireless tech. 
I think there's almost an expectation from staff and students, especially they walk into the university and everything should just work wirelessly. So we've invested heavily uh, in the capability uh, and the bandwidth across our wireless network. You cannot make an investment in portable technology and not make a similar investment within the infrastructure to support it. Because if the wireless experience is bad, it's game over. So you have to recognize that if you are moving to a wireless portable experience, your infrastructure will definitely need some investment as well. All right. Yeah, okay, cool. Good. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Chris and Kevin. Thank you. Thank you.